We are now recording. So welcome everybody. I'm Jamie Good, the Digital Fluency Coach. This is our Unpacking Digital Transformation series that I've been doing with Kim. And we're really excited to have Dan on today. So if you wouldn't mind, Dan, telling us who you are and what you do. Hello, everyone. Hello, Kim. Hello, Jamie. Good friends of mine. Happy, delighted, and really thankful to be here. It's Monday. What a way to kick off a week. Just blabbing. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I do things uh, really bad. I do things really well. Blabbing is one of the things I do well, which is just. <laughs> uh, so first and foremost, uh, Father Hubby to Denise, Claire, Cole, and Kate. The aforementioned latter three are the goats. Uh, we now live in Victoria, British Columbia, beautiful BC. Moved west in mm. 1995. So we've been uh, out west for 20 years, which coincidentally is how long Denise and I have now been married. She still puts up with me. I married up. And uh, right now, I am the um, chief envisioner. We made up a word for a group called the TELUS Transformation Office, TTO. Uh, TTO is a group that looks and helps out organizations with their own quest for really, um, you know, the digital transformation, the future of work, uh, improve employee engagement, flexible work styles, all this kind of good stuff. And then on the side, I, you know, do a little bit of speaking, a little bit of writing, and uh, pump out a few books every now and then. Awesome. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, exciting to have you uh, in, in the discussion because I followed you and, and what you've been doing with TELUS and, and the Flat Army book and, and very interested in your perspective of, of where we're going and what we need to do to equip ourselves because I think it's a, it's a unique one and it's, one, dare I say, is proven because you, you've done so much, you, you've made so much traction um, with TELUS um, through some of the initiatives uh, that I think it's, it's cool to, to share that out. So really neat. Delighted and to be myself, here. And myself, sorry? Delighted to be here. Ask anything. Sure. And I, uh, I own a little consultancy firm here in Toronto, do executive coaching and uh, strategy development facilitation and so, do a little bit of management training as well. So. Uh, but I, I know a lot of my clients are interested in digital transformation. And as I mentioned before we went on air, you know, Jamie and I started this because we're so curious about where the world is headed because we see it. And I'm not sure everyone sees it, number one, um, this digital transformation and what's happening. And then also, how do we equip ourselves and organizations to really succeed in the future? And that, that to me, is, is kind of cool to, to take a look at. All right. Well, we've got six hours, right? Yeah. 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 30 minutes. <laughs> okay, fair enough. We can do it. We can do it. Yeah, so, um, and Jamie, I didn't know if you wanted to introduce yourself a little bit, because you've got, you've got some, uh, some good things on the go. Uh, well, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help people future-proof their businesses and careers by becoming more digitally fluent, and I'm hit it, heading in some different directions these days, trying to disrupt things and, and go along with the disruption, disruption that's already happening and help people kind of manage it. I, um, I like to kind of poke people and kind of give them a kick in the butt every so often, so I, I make t-shirts like this. <laughs> You, you and uh, Luis Suarez, my buddy, are uh, two peas in a pod. <laughs> oh, <laughs> totally. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm so excited to get in on this. And, and Kim and I were just, uh, when we started talking about this earlier in the year, I said, you know, let's just start going for this. Let's just ask some people to join us on some chats. And while we learn by doing it on Blab, for example, a live stream in public way like this and then sharing it uh, after the fact of recording, um, people can learn along with us. So I think it's really exciting to just kind of do that working out loud and show your work thing um, and, and have people come along in this journey. So I, I love it. Good stuff. So, you know, the first question I kind of, that's been on my mind, Dan, from your perspective is what do you believe the impact of this digital transformation will be to to not only organizations but the the employees and the leaders that that work within the organization where do you see it wow going? well Small uh, question. <laughs> yeah, yeah let's unpack that one uh it, there's there's probably a whole different bunch of ways in which to answer that so not the least of which is um there is a digital train and if you're not on it uh, you will be left behind. And so look at this example. I mean, um, Slack, I don't think really thought that Blab would take off and be a Google Hangouts killer. 
Uh, <laughs> but here we are, like four or five months later, since it really was, you know, quote, unleashed to the world. And, and how many leaders in an organization, when you said, oh, I'm doing a blab today, how many are astute enough to have sorted out, oh, I, I know what Dan's doing, it's, it's a blab. So my point being, if email sucks, to Jamie's point, <laughs> what is going on inside of a leader's head when new technology keeps coming and you have to both assess and understand its importance? Now, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a, I'm a fan of not dropping technology on a company and then saying, have at her. You, yeah, really right. have to, you really have to have the behaviors. So this is my shtick in life, right? If your organizational behaviors are inculcating fear or apathy or command and control, then the next blab is inconsequential. I.e., if you were to mm -hmm. sort of drop a blab on the organization, yeah, you'll have the the uh, the people like us that you know love bells and whistles and they'll use it and say this is great, but will it become an organizational institution? Will it help change your culture, or more importantly, will it help drive your business results? That's dependent on the behaviors inside your organization. So really, I think there's a when you unpack digital transformation and where are we today, I think there's still a lot of work to do to coalesce a more open, collaborative, behavioral mindset so that these wonderful tools like Blab et al. Uh, can actually have a fair chance and shot at succeeding inside an organization. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's interesting to, to you know, open a collaborative and, and behavioral mindset that may not be in an organization, right? And, and you mentioned something that I'm interested in because you said you got to assess and understand first what's out there. And you know, we're moving at such a pace, right? Leaders, employees, organizations really moving at such a pace that, you know, how do you actually inculcate that, that sort of um, impetus for openness when you're just struggling to meet the, you know, quarterly numbers? Well, there's a far many number of leaders and organizations that have what's been coined a short terminism mindset as to your point right kim that they yeah. tend to look at making the number and that could be a budget number if you're a bureaucratic kind of public sector institution or in fact if you're a for-profit even publicly traded organization you're myopic to the short term so what we do need is a is an organizational behavior change on thinking about the long term in parallel with the short term. So you need to think exactly. through, not just set a three-year plan and say, this is what we're gonna be when we grow up in three years, but set out, I guess I would say, the um, behavioral change to get you there three years, mm -hmm. in three years time. But it's, what's the other metaphor? So the organization, we're all flying a plane and the plane's in the air. And not only do you have to refuel it mid-air, you get to change uh, the fuselage such that it's a lighter, more nimble and flexible uh, fuselage in order to reach destination B in a quicker, more expedited and cost efficient way. But the plane is still in the air. Mm -hmm. so, so how do we do that? We do that with trying to figure out a way in which your organization can work together, <laughs> crazy term, uh, yeah. <laughs> to, to build out or I guess update or enhance a fuselage and ultimately, uh, you know, as that team, you're gonna have to explore new technologies, right, in order to make the fuselage more light efi or efficient or lighter and so on. So there's always a yin yang for me between technology and behavior, but you have to be thinking about the long term in order to, as I say, metaphorically fly your plane faster and get to the destination quicker, better, cheaper, faster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that the, that the yin yang, you said that. I went to a Qigong uh, course this weekend, uh, so I was very interested in the yin yang. But the, the, the whole um, tech and behavior that, that um, um, sort of push-pull of organizations looking long-term and short-term um, that you have to have. You have to have a leader that, you know, um, setting the vision for, uh, uh, you know, a certain course and then adapting midstream. You've got to have employees that are, 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 are working hard and trying to get, you know, things done, but also looking for continuous improvement. And so it's almost like it's a, it's a duality in the workplace that we have to embrace now if we're going to be successful. Is that what I've heard? You've absolutely heard that. I mean, 
moons ago, I think more than a decade, I can't remember the actual published date, but um, Tom Malone uh, wrote a book and really out of that came, how do we shift from command and control to cultivate and coordinate? I've always loved that, that yin yang. And so yeah. cultivate to me is, is sort of acting like a farmer, right? You're cultivating crops, but you should be working together with the crew, the farm hands, you know, and the machinery, right, to grow said new crop. And then if you're coordinating, you're working with your product, you're working with your team in which to then, you know, prosper uh, in a longer term play. And, and plus also to reap the benefit of the short term, i.e. producing of that crop for the particular year in question. So cultivate coordinate, using another metaphor, I suppose, with the farmer analogy, um, th that that's to me an organization. We need to be cultivating that type of coordinated culture because, you know, Command and control is is just slightly antiquated in my mind, and 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 some organizations, some high tech firms, when they're out there selling their product to an organization, and then six, twelve, eighteen months later, it becomes shelfware or what are called ghost towns. You know, particularly some of the collaboration platforms. I, it's always it always butts against what the behavior of that organization is. So there, there's a conflict that, that is often manifesting between what the health or ethics or culture is of the organization, the software dudes and dudettes that come in and sell something, and there's, well, it's, it's either not working or no one's using it, or that's the conflict, right? <coughs> often. Yeah. And then I, don't get me, I mean, don't get me started about, you know, IT, HR, CFO, you know, that, that, that triple bottom line there, if you will, right? So when you have HR, CFO, and CIO, and their, um, you know, the way in which that they see their world and their lens, it's important, but it's really important for those three to come together because you've got the investments that are required, you've got the technology you've got that's required, obviously, and then you've got the behavioral hiring, promoting, succession planning, performance evaluation, if you will, incentivizing, you know, confidence, like it's all related. So the sort of three legs to the stool, if you're gonna unpack, you know, digital transformation, it's not just CIO's responsibility. It's not just the HR or chief learning officer or that role. It's not just the CFO and saying, here's how much money you're allotted this year, go for it. I think you need some really good alignment between those three. Yeah, for sure. I love that ghost town expression because um, I find when I when I push ahead with trying to talk about the tech and some of the things that are out there and available to people, um, this is I, I haven't heard the term that way, but it makes a lot of sense. It's the ghost town. You get you get Yammer in there, and everybody's going to use Yammer, and we're all going to be so cool, and then yeah. nothing happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, I call it uh, the crickets effect. Right? Uh, totally, totally. <laughs> That happened to me uh, in a in a in the in a job that I was in where I I wanted to jump into Yammer and for the first week I was like messaging I was adding stuff and after a week I'm not getting anything back I'm like, well I guess I don't need to use this anymore. <laughs> yeah, and then you, this is what you hear you hear and you just you, the organization or this team goes to the next shiny object right and then yep. again if you think about the. Um, you know, the uh, technology adoption curve, there are always going to be people, and I confess to being one of them, that will try technology just because. I mean, yeah, yeah. I grew up with the Atari 2600, and I thought ET was a good <laughs> game, right? I'm one of those guys. Like, clearly I'm 44, right? <laughs> but that doesn't mean that I'm gonna drop ET, the extraterrestrial, the Atari 2600 game, on an organization thinking this is the yeah, yeah, yeah. all end all. You need to have that behavior piece too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and that, and that's a that's the thing that I I don't hear as much is is where you're saying that the two need to kind of come together where it's not just oh look at all these great tools but the culture needs to be there to want to use those tools. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and I think you you underpin for me that that's new. The behaviors really have to have to be considered that you want to. So it's 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 almost a deliberate behavior that you need to cultivate. Mm -hmm. As opposed to just let it happen through, you know, um, competencies or development or what have you. There's almost a deliberacy of, of this is how I need people to behave. And therefore, I've got to support the, the organization has to support the, um, the fruition of that. 
So here's here's a here's a line. I don't know if it would fit in a tweet, but leaving your culture to chance, happenstance, or ser serendipity is a recipe for disaster. Yeah, it's true. Did you did you just make that up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> it's a disaster. So why I agree with you. So why do you think it, it, it and what's the impact of that if you do leave it to chance? Well, if you leave your culture to chance, happenstance, or serendipity, at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're leaving to chance your success, your growth, and perhaps your survival. Yeah. I mean, we need look no further if you're a Canadian to Nortel. Yep. Here's an organization that had for years a very thriving, open, engaging culture. It was, it was magnificent. But then the hierarchy, the command and control, the myopia, the, you know, we're, we're better than anyone else mm -hmm. started to sink in, particularly at the senior mm -hmm. level. And there's a wonderful case study written at the um, University of Ottawa um, with the Telfer Business School that goes into this in, in deep, deep insight about how power and how um, ignorance really created what happened to be the demise of Nortel. So to answer your question, yeah, you could be a Nortel on top of the world at you know, whatever it was, 50% share of the TSX and yeah. every, every media and stock analyst darling you could think of, and nor, now they're fighting over $9 billion in assets to give out to you know, the 6,000 creditors that are still due money. It's, yeah. that's what can happen. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, you talk, you, we, we talked a little bit about that triumvirate of HR, IT, and finance, but I want to dive into HR because, you know, uh, Jamie and I are both from a learning and development background, right? Um, but what do, what do you feel that, that that side of the house really needs to reinforce now or do differently in order to, to thrive um, in this, in digital disruption, other than focusing on behaviors and, and the right behaviors to, to adapt. What else do you feel? Uh, so I, I've said this publicly before, so I'll say it again. It was at, at a conference a couple of years ago. I was speaking to uh, folks in the learning profession, and I said, here's the one thing that I hope that you take away from this short kind of 20-minute talk. It's that I want you to instill a sense of forest gumption in your everyday <laughs> actions. And so, I guess third story metaphor, uh, we think about Forrest Gump, you, you kind of put in Forrest Gumption, right? So who, first of all, who is Forrest Gump? So there's a guy and you might say, oh, you know, quote, Zemeckis called him an idiot, right? Literally on the uh, knowledge scale back in the day. But what did he have? I mean, he had guts, he had courage, he had perseverance, uh, you know, if you're a Duckworth fan, you might say that he had grit and really he had gumption at the end of the day. And no matter what, that sort of grit, perseverance, gumption, he'd go into scenarios saying, you know what, I, I can do this, no big deal, even though he was classified as an idiot. So the best example, perhaps, from that movie is, um, you know, he's in Vietnam and uh, you remember Jenny sort of said, Forrest, if you get in trouble, just run, Forrest, run. And that's where, so... They were kind of, you know, it was all the sideways rain after all that stuff was happening, all the 55 different types of rain, and after he heard the 55 different types of shrimp that he could make from <laughs> So he, So he goes, they're in the forest, they're in a recon mission, and then all of a sudden, you know, Charlie shows up, and they start blasting. And, and so it's, what did he do? He listened to Jenny, and he starts running back to the, to the base. And he got there, he's like, where's Bubba? And I got to go say Bubba. He runs back into the line of fire looking for Bubba, picks up like seven of his mates, dumps him off, finally gets Bubba and brings him back and sadly Bubba dies. But it's that gumption, like going into the fire, knowing that it's going to be difficult, but uh, having that sort of grit, that perseverance, that courage, even though it's scary, <laughs> uh, that's what the CLO, the learning shop needs to do is understand that, look, technology is going to change. You know, artificial intelligence is here. Robotics and automation is going to replace a lot of things in our organization. So if that's the case, why aren't you at least lockstep, if not ahead of that, mm -hmm. with your gumption intact, trying to help the organization sort out how it's going to deal with Ray Kurzweil's plan for the future for us? <laughs> right? <laughs> well, yeah, the, oh, the, that's, that's good. I love that. <laughs> 
And but uh, the apathy, I see apathy everywhere in learning and development. I oh, see. I'm not, I'm not so sure it's apathy. I sometimes think it's fear, and it's disguised uh, in in other sort of emotions or reactions. I think people are afraid. Um, I sometimes think that no, I agree with it's, it's this fear of the unknown. So I say to someone live streaming video and they're like, what? Like Periscope, what? And just that, the fact that they have a no clue what that means is it, it already put it puts up like sort of a barrier because neuro, neuro, neuroscience says that if we don't understand something, we run from it, right? Mm -hmm. It's that fight or flight response that has been built into us that if was, there's the not clarity and we can't understand, then we immediately think threat. And so I think that's one of the problems we have with the tech and L and D for some reason has this in like spades where people are just, they have this fear of the new. And when I first started about using Twitter as, as a training tool, people freaked out. Like I, I remember that like going to some um, learning events where people were just like Twitter, like what their phones in their hand during my session, what are you talking about? And there was just all this crazy reaction as opposed to what you're seeing, where it's just like, oh, that sounds interesting. I'm just going to jump in there and do that. Yeah, and you know, I don't disagree actually with Kim. I think there, there is some apathy, um, and I, I'm not going to go into percentages. At least that would be throwing almost everybody under the bus. So let's not do that. But there is some apathy. Uh, but I think it is agreed, Jamie. There is fear of the unknown. Um, Churchill once said, uh, to improve is to change, but to be perfect is to change often. And mm. so if you are resolute in the status quo, then how are you ever going to change? And let's be clear, um, the world is changing, you know, um, yeah. in every way imaginable. So for, for l and I mean, when I was in l and I actually changed the name from L&D to l and C at TELUS. I didn't believe that it was learning and development. Actually, it's learning and collaboration, mm -hmm. right? So even just little subtle changes like that can hopefully have a ripple effect. Another say, oh yeah, it's, we're not developing. We're collaborating with one another. That's what learning is. We collaborate. Yeah. And that's the new definition, I think, of learning for the future. It is all about collaborating in different ways, in different uh, mediums, in different capacities to, to get the learning um, that we need just in time to, to, to help us navigate the future. I, I really I've, do believe it. I've been saying forever that if learning isn't one of your top three, if you will, behaviors in the organization, and, the, and however, you redefine the definition of learning, at least in my world, the way that I believe it's, it's not doing away with formal, it's augmenting with informal and social. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, but if you don't, if you have an organization's learning and development, the training shop that is just fixated on the learning management system and bums and seats and tracking e-learning courses, a number of, you know, people that have sat in a course or taken a course that's, that is in and of itself the sage on the stage mentality, not the guide on the side ethos that really an organization should be as its overarching behavior is that, hey, we're here to help. How can we collaborate? Do you need help? Hey, I need help. Will you help, right? If the organization has what I call organizational NIMBY, you know, not in my backyard, mm -hmm. then it's a training org. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard NIMBY before. I like it. <laughs> It always reminds me of the Chalk Circle song, that band from the eighties. <laughs> but I, I want to, you know, with with Flat Army and the work you did there, and sort of sharing your your perspective on on organizations and 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 what they need to do to be that collaborative and, and that successful and, and um, in the future. I know you've got a new perspective coming out, more of a, on on meaning in in individual perspective on your career and your leadership and. And I know it's not out yet, but I'm, I'm sure there's some things full, you know, forming and, and, and getting baked there. But, you know, what role does meaning have in, in, in the careers of the future and leadership for the future, in your perspective? Um, well, as I've found, I think meaning means everything. Um, and that sounds shrill and, you know, frivolous even. Um, but 
well, if I if I sort of back it up, Flat Army was a culture changing playbook book, and and it suggested that if you have these types of leadership behaviors organizationally, not just individually, but if your organization has these set of leadership behaviors, if your organization believes and can and instill the pervasive learning, i.e., formal and formal social, if you can use collaborative technologies as a way in which to manifest the open behaviors and the leadership and learning models I suggest, then you have a flat army. And it wasn't an oxymoron per se. Army comes from the word armada, which means flotilla, which means there's still a hierarchy, there's still a captain, there's still a crew, but it's a more benevolent hierarchy. And it's sort of moving together from point A to point B. So that's flat army. But what I discovered was that, you know what, it actually starts with you as an individual. And so if there's, if it, and it, I guess if you were to read the two books, you'd read The Purpose Effect first, and then you'd read Flat Army, because The Purpose Effect is about, if you think of a Venn diagram, there's three pieces. At the top of it is um, personal purpose. So mm -hmm. am I constantly developing myself? That's my what. Um, have I defined who I am in life? So that's your, I call it a declaration statement, right? And then third, do you decide how to show up every day? That's a decision point. So what am I about? Uh, how am I going to operate every day? And who am I, essentially? So that's the, the personal purpose. But we all got to make some money. Mm -hmm. I mean, it goes without saying we just that we need to, you know, I occasionally like riding my bike and maybe buying a new bike, right? So I need to make some money to go buy a bike. Um, okay. If such is the case, then down at the bottom of the van is organizational and role. So let's look at organizational for a second. So what's the purpose of an org? In the for-profit world, is it just for profit or for shareholder return? Is it not to potentially do good deeds, which is what I call it? So how do you deliver value? How are you ethical? You think about uh, Volkswagen and what sort of happened in that mm -hmm. part of the world. Is that ethical? How do you think those employees feel? There's hundreds, there's tens of thousands of them. Think they feel good about their unethical organization right now? And so on. So that's the organizational piece. If your personal purpose is in alignment with your organization's purpose, then ideally you have role purpose. Mm -hmm. And thus you have a, what I call the purpose mindset. But if there's mm -hmm. something in arrears between that sort of combination, you can have one of two other mindsets. And this is where I was interested to hear your thoughts actually. So you can have a job mindset. A job mindset is apathy or kind of apathetic, hedonic, in it for the paycheck only, you know. I, and that's okay for some people. They get their kicks elsewhere in life and they know that it's just a transaction. So they're using the organization for the paycheck. Okay, but I, I don't think that's healthy for society or everybody. For a few, sure. So there's that problem, right? And then the second one is the career mindset people. Not in the traditional sense of career, but I call them the bullies. So the ones that are kicking you out of the way because they're climbing the ladder and they don't really give a rat's ass about you and your self and your team or whatever. They're just there to make it, you know, that's the, there's no I in team people, right? That They put I in there. It's them. And so if you have a whole bunch of people with a job mindset because the organization's not fulfilling it, you have people who are in a career mindset because the organization's culture is one of power, control, climb the ladder, then this whole thing falls apart. But if you've defined yourself, you've decided who you are, and you're con continuously developing your skills, your who am I, this, you know, I am, this is my purpose, mm -hmm. then you mm -hmm. find the organization or, in fact, create an organization or work for yourself such that you're in charge of your own organizational good deeds, you will have a purpose mindset. So I found through the research, the stories, interviews, that this purpose effect is really important. If, if you can have more people with it, then a flat army, it turns out, is easier. Mm -hmm. And you probably get more, more from those people and the cascading um, momentum caused from them because you see it and, and I I am so going back I'll have to pull my old coach Bob Rusby who said Kim are you living on purpose ah. and uh, it was it was a challenge oh god like I don't know 15 16 years ago and I was like well I think so he's like well what is it and and that was really hard to answer and you know I'm still still changing and and and, and redefining it as I go on in life 
but that's what I'm hearing from you. It's like it, it what you you've got to challenge yourself. What is yeah. your purpose, right? Absolutely. And, and if you can get the alignment with an organization, and I guarantee, like if if this becomes a rallying cry for people, you know, through the digital age, you're going to be more in alignment and and certainly happier, in my opinion, right? To doing the work, and then that the organization will get more from you. So it's it's that yin yang again, right? You're exactly. going to give more, and they're going to get more, and it and it's going to um, oscillate. Uh, to and from everyone else in the organization. Well, I, I tell you, it's I'm, it's bang on. I it, it was a difficult book to write. It's now done. Uh, comes out next year. It's not a plug. It's just what 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 was interesting was that I thought I was writing it for the organization at first. Yeah. Then I wrote I rewrote it and said no, it's for the individual employee, the team member. I was like, you know what? Actually, this is for both. Like. You, if there's the yin yang, if the individual employee, because we all work in an organization, whether you're the CEO or not, you're part of an organization. So it's actually this, and if you're an organization of one, that's cool too, but you're an individual and you're part of an organization. And you must really, we ought to be thinking it through how the organization helps serve the employee's purpose, but how the employee can serve themselves and the organization. That's why it's a Venn diagram of three. Anyway, it was fun. I, well, I think, well, writers no, well are I think it's really interesting, and I'll have to introduce you to a, a, a friend and colleague of mine who did her dissertation on this about oh. um, 10, no, even longer, about 15 years ago as well, um, uh, Dr. Heather Spradako. So I'll, I'll make sure you guys get connected because she could have some insight from you. So, you know, we were finished our sort of 30, 30 minutes and of, of understanding and I'm so grateful but it, you know are there any other thoughts that you want to you know leave us with as, as you think about digital transformation and, and sort of what we what we've discussed so far I have four pages of notes <laughs> well I think one one other thing is that um, we, we really ought to be agnostic in the technology I don't yeah. I don't really subscribe to you know, one particular tech, and I think that's where the creativity, the curiosity has to come into play, whether it's HR, the L&D shop, the marketing shop, the finance shop, the IT shop, it, it doesn't, like, you You really have to experiment, and yeah. and at some point, you know, you do have to, <laughs> everyone's got to dip their toes in and see whether the water's warm or cold, so just experiment, and, you know, some things don't work, and some things won't work for your organization, that's okay, like, Move on, but if you're just tepid or timid or meek, um, you know, the organization ends up suffering in the end. If you're in a position to try some things and sort of help the organization out with some of those newish tools, but again, let's not forget, we're hopefully uh, instilling that sense of purpose in your, your culture in parallel. I just, you know, try it. It's okay. It may not work, but just give it a shot. Cool. Yeah, and Thank I, I had so a, uh, I was just gonna say I had an experience with that in, in, a, in a job, a past job where we were trying to get like a project management tool that wasn't Microsoft Project because that's too big for what we needed, but we needed, we had too many people and too many pieces involved to not have something. And so we just tested things out. We tried Rike and then we tried Basecamp and then we tried something else. and. Then we tried Asana and we landed on Asana. Everybody liked it and we, we, they're still using it today. So um, it was nice to have that experience of just, let's just try it. Let's just see what happens. And if we go two weeks and it's not really fitting our team and how we work, we'll try something else. And I was glad that we were able um, to do that because it just made so, it, of course it made things more organized. We were more efficient. We were more productive. We didn't miss things like we were doing before because they were all down there listed out in Asana, so we weren't making as many mistakes, and it was great. So uh, I totally agree with the agnostic thing. Um, I get really frustrated when people are like hardcore Apple fanboys or Android, whatever, because if it, if it works for you, it might not work for me, and it might not work for them. It, whatever works for you is what, what works, basically. Mm -hmm. But it speaks yeah. to the courage. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, it's, it's the technology that can, however, aid and abet your culture change or your corporate or, you know, not-for-profit or public sector ethos. And so if you, if you are hesitant and don't have that courage, Kim, to your point, 
um, to instill or to try or implement some of those technologies, then you're never going to allow the technology to aid and abet the culture change that you're trying to, you know, erect. So that's where we exactly. go back to the yin yang comment again. Yep, exactly. It all comes back to that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dan, for for uh, you know sharing your thoughts. And I'm looking so forward to. I'm going to sign up for your getting your book online because I I'm really looking forward to to reading that portion of it. And okay. and you know I'm grateful that you shared some time with us today and and uh, and your thoughts. You guys are friends. Friends are family. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so now what we do, Jamie and I um, just continue on and sort of just for a few minutes try and unpack what we've learned from, from you today, even a, another le level. So we've done a pack digital transformation on one level and then we're going to unpack it uh, again and, and then we'll, we'll share some, um, some of the stuff on a Padlet um, oh, as cool. well as this video. So awesome. All right. Uh, Look forward to uh, to your thoughts. Yeah, well, without further ado, then thank you so much for the invite. Uh, really appreciate it. Love the chat, and uh, maybe we'll do this again sometime. Cool. For Thanks sure, so we love it. And thanks for your time, right, Dan. Really appreciate Ciao. it. Bye. Ciao. Cheers. Wow, that's really great. And you know, one thing that first came to my mind when he was talking about Nortel was RIM, because I'm living here in Kitchener Waterloo, where RIM was the superstar smartphone. Right. And that was really struggling and, and Priv, their latest model is kind of like, if this doesn't work, we're done. We're done. And it, what, what is so interesting is that it went, took me back to our conversation with Dave Gray too, because I've been thinking about this hiring disruptors and having a startup within uh, your company. And now it's so interesting. And it's something I'd like to explore further that all around KW now, there's all these little startups and there's these app yeah. companies and there's, there's all this stuff going on. These are all previous RIM. They're all previous BlackBerry workers. And it just, if, if, if the kind of insight that That's Dave had has was to take all of these talented people that were already with inside the company and have them build startups within BlackBerry, I bet you BlackBerry would be a completely different thing today and probably still top of the pile. That's interesting. And then layer on, Jamie, what, what Dan was saying about, you know, living on purpose I, I i we got to interview some of these guys doing it because i i bet you there's a correlation there that they yep. those 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 folks that you know used to work with rim and have this sort of mentality to to go in and and um be curious and try new things and um are doing these startups and and i wonder i wonder if their alignment they're on purpose is is aligned to the the organization, and that's why that we're seeing some some of this bubbling up in the, in the Kitchener Waterloo area. Yeah, it's very very yeah very good point, and something I think yeah we should totally explore. And I'm gonna actually I know some people right now that I can contact, so I will do that um, for sure. The one thing that I really liked about what he said um, was long term in parallel with short term. Yeah, and I think that that is something that I try to do myself and I was um, trying to push in, in the last uh, few jobs that I've had where I, I kept looking like out like a year or two and thinking mm, this might fall apart in about six months we maybe want to rethink that and I got frustrated when people get so busy with the today that they don't think about the tomorrow the next week two weeks down the mm -hmm. road but I understand how difficult it be, can be. And this is one of the funny things and where it's so funny that the yid and yag comes in again because what I find is helpful in, t in being able to help you get the stuff done that you need to get done today while also thinking about how that's going to impact uh, four months down the road is the digital tools, is what he is saying where you are agnostic in your tech and you just choose a few tools, you try them out, you see how they work and they will help you, I believe, and this is why I push this so much with mm -hmm. my digital fluency. I believe that when you find the right ones for you, that will free up your time enough to be able to think beyond just what's in front of your face today. Yeah, that short term and long term. Well, and it speaks to the other point that I thought was a really good um, uh, reflection point for people um, and really organizations too. But he, he mentioned assess and understand. Right. Mm -hmm. Assess where you are. 
and understand. I'm like, wow, okay, that's pretty, pretty cool, right? I mean, I think back to when, you know, you and I, you started being my digital coach. I was like, I, I am so far behind on everything. You know, I was assessing where I, where I was and, and where I wanted to be and understanding the gap more, more importantly, before I took action. Even though I knew it was there, do you know what I mean? Like, so there's that yep. element that maybe from living on purpose, we've got to one assess and understand what the the external context or the organization or what have you um, reflects the internal reality. Mm -hmm. And also, when he mentioned assess and understand, I wrote that down because. I'm thinking a lot also with all of this tech, with all of this digital disruption, and we've talked about this before, of still being mindful and yeah. of stopping to reflect and of taking a few deep breaths here and there so that you're able to uh, give your brain the space to actually figure out what's really going on and then make some good plans as opposed to just tripping over the next thing and tripping over the next thing and hoping you'll get there eventually. Yeah, I think that's 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 becoming a theme for me in terms of that mindfulness, right? That is, is really mm -hmm. important to, that's really going back. It's like Tether, we keep coming back to in all of these conversations. So I find that yep. interesting. Yeah, it's a fantastic. Isn't it? But the yeah. the other the other thing that struck me, which is the blinding glimpse of the obvious, right? Having yeah. HR and IT and yeah, 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 yeah. work together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, there kind of has to be alignment there, right? Uh, I know. I but that's what frustrates me is that when when you have that conversation and when you just say that, you're like, uh, duh, of course, but then when you go and you sit with people who are these decision makers and have those initial initials behind their name, they're not seeing it that way. No. I, I mean, it, it, when, when it's, when we look at like 2016 is just around the corner and, and like he said, blab has come out slack yammer, all of this stuff like igloo. Oh my God. The amount of tech tools out there is just insane. And we still freaking work in silos. It yeah. just blows my mind. Yeah, yeah, but it but it's interesting to see. Okay, so you know, a best practice for organizations, teams, maybe in leaders, like look short term and long term. Um, mm -hmm. You know, think about the 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 behaviors, the technology, and 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 the money you got to do what you need to get done. Um, in working in you know in inculcated and um, weave together in a way right before you, yeah. you you go on and 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 start doing anything it's almost like thinking it through before you actually implement yeah. and continuing yeah. to reflect on that and thinking it through as you yeah. implement. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. And it's interesting that you mentioned money, which didn't really come up in the conversation today, but. It, it, it really fantastic thing about all of this is that you can really try out a few things for free. Good point. So the, the example that I gave where we worked through Rike and then Basecamp and then um, I forget what the third one was and then landed on Asana. All of these were free for our team. And we did it like what I like to say all the time, baby steps. We try a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little, and, and go slow through it. Like it's really difficult for someone like me though, with my, my fast ADHD brain to, to, to be patient and wait for people to kind of do this, but you have to just do it slowly. Uh, you know, show people the advantages and the benefits. So once we stop making as many mistakes and once we, we had less decision fatigue because the, the tool was just pointing out what needed to be done that day. Yeah. Well, then everybody started to realize, oh yeah, this is good. Okay, now I'm understanding why we should be exploring these tools. And and it, but it took time. And, and I, I realized at the time, I just gotta be patient and do the baby steps. It cannot be, um, you, you can't be going in there like kind of like a bull in a yeah. China shop and just going like, okay, we're gonna do this like right now. But then the other thing I see there, though, is a balance where, okay, so we have the baby steps. We can't push people into it quickly, but we also can't be so slow that digital transformation just zooms right by us. And like you said, we missed that train completely. That's it. That's it. So so what would you, based on what we, we learned today, what would you say are baby steps for the L&D professional? Um, I believe... Uh, the just jump in thing is what I say to people all the time. So what I say to people is um, maybe choose a tool. 
you know, so you've heard about Twitter, you've never used it before, just sign up. And it doesn't mean you have to do anything with it for the first two weeks or month, but just look at it, watch it, see what happens, maybe watch a YouTube video or two uh, about it and start to just understand because I don't believe that everybody has to use all of those tools. You don't have to be using yeah. Twitter. You don't have to be on Facebook. You don't have to be on LinkedIn. But I do believe in L&D, you have to have an understanding of what they do and their potential. And, and it's not, so, so the other thing I think in terms of baby step is like maybe once, I would say once a day, but some people are maybe not okay with the once a day thing, but once a week, learn a new like shortcut, learn a new like productivity tip. Because these days I believe it's true in, in the digital world and you experience this is that it, yeah. it's, it's not just one step forward in the digital world like it is with something else. So when you are learning carpentry, and someone teaches you one special specific thing with a with a bandsaw, for example, then you get one step closer to becoming a good carpenter. But in digital, when I teach you, for example, one shortcut of like control delete or control backspace or something like that, that I believe is equal to, yeah, that's on my business card. Is I believe that that pushes you five steps ahead in digital yeah. instead of just that one step because you can use that one skill you just learned in Word, in PowerPoint, in Asana, in Twitter, in Facebook, in LinkedIn, yeah. in everything. Yeah. And so that's why I tell people just jump in and as a baby step, just try one thing this week. And then mm -hmm. next week, try one other thing. And like I, I recommended people, put it on a sticky note on the side of your monitor and try just that one new thing for a full week until mm -hmm. it becomes habit. Because as Britt Andrietta says in her neuroscience of learning course on lynda.com, we are not really, I, I, and I agree with her, we're not learning designers, we're habit designers. We're, we're basically teaching people how to change their habits. Yeah. That's interesting. So, uh, so then a, another um, insight that I received today then based on that is from a habit of, of learning and development professionals have to try and, and be this for assumption. Right. Try it. Just yeah. try and, and step outside of it a little bit. And the habits that we have around learning management systems and all of these, you know, bums and seats and go beyond to say, OK, what are what are the, the real behaviors? How are we pushing courage and and vulnerability and mindfulness? How are we going to do that? And how can we do it in a in a in a quick and cheap and cheerful way? that just starts yeah. the ball ro rolling, right? Like, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. my daughter in her school does um, mindful moments and they, they come across the PA and she's in high school and they do two minutes of breathing. And I'm like, cool, that's really cool. And she goes, well, no one really does it until you get up into like grade 11, 12, when you start to get stressed, you know, stressed out and, and you become, but they've built that habit over those, those two previous years to then really take advantage of it when they need to. So it's interesting. That's amazing. I, know, I, I love, love it. that. Yeah. So thank you, Jamie. This was uh, another yet again, some, some reinforcement here. And I'm seeing some of the themes regarding the mindfulness as, as I mentioned, but, but really a different layer and that organizational um, and, and in, in interpersonal and personal relationship that that's um, coming to play here that he really put together. Really neat. Yep. Thank I you. love it. Thank you too. We'll talk thanks soon. Thanks everybody who uh, joined in today too. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Take care. Okay. Until next time. See Bye. ya. Bye.